All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stigma Free Society's Facebook Live event. My name is Jerry Friesen, also known as a recovering farmer. I am a stress and conflict management specialist working out of Manitoba. Because of my own journey with mental illness, I have a real passion in talking about it because it is in talking to others we can find a path forward for ourselves. You can learn more about me by visiting jerryfriesen.ca. Through this Facebook Live event, I am representing the Stigma Free Society, which is a Canadian registered charity that aims to reduce stigma of all kinds with a focus on mental health. This event is part of their Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit, an online community-based mental health program that creates access to mental health, education, and peer support training, as well as practical and relatable resources for those living in rural and agricultural communities. You can find the toolkit at ruralmentalwellness.com. I am excited today to have the opportunity to chart, chat with Marty Waldman, Welcome, Marty. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, invite. Before we get into some of the questions I have for Marty, here's a quick introduction for him. Marty Waldman is the head facilitator at Lone Eagle Ventures, located within Stony Nakoda lands in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Through Lone Eagle Ventures Equine Assisted Learning, Marty brings his over 20 years of firsthand experience with the healing power of horses to the First Nations children and youth. Marty has over 25 years of experience in the fields of acting, stunts, wrangler work, administration, and First Nations stunt action consulting. In addition to Lone Eagle Ventures, he is also co founder of Stunt Nations, a 100% Indigenous owned nonprofit organization focused on enabling and empowering youth to learn how to become effective and authentic stunt persons for film and television. He has a passion for helping Indigenous children and youth reach their full potential. Wow, Marty, it sounds like you have an exciting life. <clears throat> oh, I try. Yeah, no kidding. So can you begin by telling our audience more about Lone Eagle Ventures and what the organization does exactly? Uh, Lone Eagle Ventures is... Uh... We use horses to um, teach life skills to children, people, uh, learning how to communicate, problem solve, and uh, just to bonding with uh, our horses. Um, every First Nations in the world um, has, a, um, has a connection with our horse. So we bring that back and we bring our cultural uh, connection back with the horses and, and stuff like that. So, and uh, we use uh, our, our stony language um, very much in, in part of our teachings and stuff like that to help the kids understand what, you know, what's what and, and everything else with uh, regards to what the verses are, including, including the, 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 the painting of the symbols that's on horses and stuff like that. We, we, we teach a class on that. Um, not only that, but we, you know, little things like grooming the horse, um, stuff, you know, th things like that helps connect people to the kids to the horse. And which it, it goes beyond that because they start taking care of something else that big, then they start take, taking care of themselves. So that's what we want, right? We want to have those moments where we say, aha, there's a, there's a teachable moment. And we, uh, we take that time and we sit and talk with them and tell them what they learned today and see how they feel. Yeah. You know, I interviewed someone a while ago that that um, does equine therapy, and and I learned a lot about horses then. And those horses are amazing animals. Yeah, they are. They are. They're very. They're at a different level than we are for sure. Yeah. So, what is equine assisted learning? Can you say more about that? <clears throat> equine assisted learning is that uh, we go through uh, different obstacles in order to like. There's a uh, um, I, the best way to put it is that there's um, there's uh, obstacles that are put that are built that lead up to a certain thing that like the, again uh, maybe the object of the day is teamwork so there's an obstacle around that that makes the teams work together and communicate and problem solve and, and stuff and then um, and again that helps teach that those life skills that a lot of our uh, First Nations uh, children including myself have. Uh, um, have a, a, a missed out on and so we try to bring that back together and 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 help the kids again learn how to problem solve break down barriers move barriers 
uh, there's a lot of things that we go, you know, the best way I could put it is, again, we teach life skills um, using horses and also the mental health aspect is uh, a horse, sitting on a horse will do wonders to people and including watching them in our culture. And my, how I was taught is that when you're done riding your horse and he goes and rolls and stuff, he's, he's knocking off all the bad energy that he picked up from you. Oh, really? So, that's interesting. That, yeah. It, that, but that's in my culture. It might be different in other places and stuff. Yeah. But that, that's what I was taught. Well, so, so there's that direct link again. And this is what we talked about a few weeks ago between a horse being being able to sense that negative energy, perhaps it's mental health issues that the horse can sense. Oh, definitely, yeah. Can you explain a bit more about the connection while we just talked about it, but between animals and mental health? Well, animals, pay, like specifically the horse, he can pick up on how you're feeling that day. A horse mirrors you. So if you're uh, not feeling like you're doing any, you don't want to do anything that day, well, your horse is going to do the same and he's going to make you want to check yourself and do you know what's going on with you on that day if you're feeling down or if you're feeling you know you don't want to you're feeling angry your horse will pick up on that you know a horse can pick up on your heartbeat and how you're feeling from about 10 feet away so he knows uh again he's at a higher level than we are intellectually and you know and stuff even how we how our body language moves you know horses can't talk but they're masters of uh non-verbal communication which is what we teach the kids is you know, and, and even in our world, you know, 80% of our communication is done with uh, with body language. You yes. know, our people are very, uh, culturally, our people are very, um, uh, we, we, we like to watch, so we're visual learners. So, you know, going back in time, our people always talk, you know, use their hands and gestures, including pointing with their lips, right? Yeah, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, we've always done that in, in Mada. If you, you know, you watch a uh, uh, stuff like dancers with wolves where they're pointing and you know it, it, that that is culturally correct it's you know because we did use our hands and stuff to do a lot of our teachings yeah that's incredibly interesting i actually wanted to circle back a little bit you said talk before about putting obstacles in front of the kids is that the way you put it what, like what kind of obstacles are you referring to so we have pylons and uh, squares like we make squares with rails and things and and, it, and it's as simple as um listening to the instructions so we have one one exercise where we tell the kids okay well you can't uh the only you have to get your horse to step in the circle or in the square and get them to step on a glove and how you you know the only the only rule is that you can't you can't step over the boundaries so there's a boundary there but they get so focused on something that um, nobody ever, ever thinks like there's an opening on one side too. And even when I do my teaching, when I talk, I walk back and forth through the opening and nobody picks up on it until you actually explain it to them. And it's, and then we go back to it's like, you know, those are the kind of teachings or problem solving that we, that we're trying to teach again. Um, the reserve line is a very big boundary that a lot of people are scared to leave. Right. And you know, to go out there and make and do something and come back. You know, I've been fortunate enough to be part of Hollywood and part of a great uh, production as Outlander where they took us all to Scotland. So, you know, if, if I was too afraid to leave, I would have never got those right. kind of opportunities. Yeah. So and stuff like that, you know, that's what we teach is that the opportunities are there. That's why I use myself a lot as a, as a uh, you know, as a tool to say, well, you know, this is what happens when you, if you do decide to leave. Yeah, when you step outside of what you feel are limitations. Yeah, and as, and also moving the boundaries. You could move them, but nobody's ever decided to try to move them. Or you know, there's one. You know, it, it is, and it's funny. Some some kids will pick up on it. I had we had one student come and he actually he lifted the horse's leg and got him to step on the glove. You know, nobody said it was wrong. He just had to think outside the box, right? And, right. And figure out a way to get it there. Yeah. Well, that, that, that sounds like that's a really good way to overcome what we often perceive as challenges in life. It is, yes. The work you do to uplift and empower youth and other folks within your community is extremely inspiring. What drives you to do that work, Marty? Um, I guess uh, for myself, the way I grew up, uh, I grew up, uh, again, is 
the um, the old uh, stereotypical uh, home. Grew up in an alcoholic setting. Um, I was abandoned as a kid. Uh, you know, my parents were both residential school survivors, uh, and so forth. Their their parents went to residential school, so it was a it was a very hard and, and trying time. And while I was trying to find myself and trying to find ways to fit in, I learned the different different uh, crafts, I guess. So I, I became a cowboy because my uncle took a, took me under my his wing, and um, and um, he taught me the ways of using the horse for, for, for work and everything else in which, you know, and I passed that along to the kids and as, as knowledge keepers, I guess. And then I, you know, I became a musician because, you know, music was always, always been a part of my life and, and stuff. So I became a musician, I, a singer and, uh, you know, powwow singer. Um, and stuff, but so I fit into a lot of things where, um, again, I was, I was searching for myself to fit in somewhere. So when you see the, the kid in the back that doesn't want to do anything, you know, that's that's the kid that I, I look at. I also have a, um, a son that have, that was born with Down syndrome. So, you know, the, the things that I work with and try to empower is, you know, I do a lot for, for him because he'll never understand what it feels like to to be a part of, you know, something like that, you know, first of all, because of the way he looks, he's outcast, you know, second of all, because of the way he acts, he's outcast, you know, so I do a lot of the things that, for the kids that can't, right, and and stuff, so, and that's why I like to try to empower it, including my kids, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling with, you know, the, the, the relationships between my kids and me, but it's working, it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, and th those relationships often are, Marty, but it's, it's interesting how you, you were able to step beyond uh, just like you're teaching kids now and, and get involved in, in a world outside of your own world. Yes. And it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it, it's bringing back that knowledge of, uh, you know, what's out there in the world, right. You, you know, being a part of Hollywood, being a part of, uh, you know, different productions, being, you know, just, just being part of any kind of musical, whatever, and, and, and stuff. And even rodeo, you know, being able to, uh, step outside your your uh, your boundaries and going out there and, and doing things. You know, we will never know, you know, the old saying, you'll never know how hot it is until you touch the water. Yeah, exactly. Can you go into a bit more detail about the unique perspectives on mental health and wellness from within Indigenous communities? Well, there's, uh, you know, a lot of our, um, a lot of our uh, mental health is trauma-based because of the effects of residential school that, that, that it's had on us, you know, um, not only that, but just going to day school as well. I remember having a, um, you know, a, a teacher that used to throw an eraser at us when we'd, uh, we do something wrong or we weren't right or whatever. So a lot of ours is trauma based and, and stuff, including the abandonment and whatever. Um, so, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, healing that we had to do behind the trauma, which is, which has affected us mentally as well, you know, big time because, um, you know, uh, silence is, uh, is, is also very abusive, uh, you know, when you get, you know, the silent treatment from people or something, and it makes you wonder, um, as well. So it's a, you know, in, for, for, in my opinion, you know, a lot of our, um, mental health, uh, issues are uh, all based out of, uh, again, out of trauma. Because, and then of course, then the alcoholism came and then the, you know, the other the other stuff the all the other kind of abuses that came along with it right yeah you know marty i'm i'm just reading a book actually which helps me understand my own mental illnesses a little better but it it talks about how trauma even like from when babies are first born in fact even sometimes before they're born how we're all how they are already affected by the negative stuff happening outside of the womb and happening when they when they are born around them and, and how that can affect their mental health going down, down the road and when they get older. And I suspect that's some, somewhat what you're talking about. Well, yeah. And then again, with, with my parents, they were going through their own stuff as well. And, you know, they're, they, uh, they, they missed out on a lot of their parenthood as well because they, they didn't understand, you know, why they were feeling this way or, you know, they had to deal with a lot of their trauma as well. You know, the stories that they told us and, and that came out of residential school, you know, and it, I just said, well, no wonder we're a lot of us, you know, dealt with that. Right. 
So my, my mom and my dad, they, you know, they ha- they ran away from their problems a lot. And, and it's just now that they're trying to deal with it and, and stuff like that. So now they have their resources to say it's okay that, you know, but what happened and it's not their fault. Right. Yeah. So again, it, it's just something that, you know, they call them, I guess they call them hereditary alcoholics in which I became, you know, it was kind of, you know, it was there. So it, it happened, but you know, it's still, again, stuff like this is what we're doing is learning how to think outside the box or whether, you know, they, whether they reach for a bottle or whether they do this, whether they do that, you know, it's something different. Okay, well, you know, we were taught, they taught, they taught us today about thinking outside, you know, problem solving. Okay, how did we pro- solve that problem today? How do we deal with conflict nowadays? You know, it, it, now there's uh, Facebook and everything else, social media that everybody blows up on, right? So the, the stuff has always been there, but now because of the social media, the power of social media, everything's being exposed now. Yes, exactly. So, and we did talk about this a wee bit, Marty, but how does equine assisted learning fit into this world view of mental health and wellness? It, uh, it, in my opinion, in my belief, it grounds people. It brings them back to dealing with uh, an animal that's, you know, uh, it's a very powerful and big animal, but very sensitive and and intelligent. Um, So, and and, uh, it helps take away a lot of the stresses again and once people understand that when people even watching a herd come together and how their herd structure is you know they they, they see the uh, hierarchy and how the the stud and the lead mayor and they how everything comes together and how they protect each other you know and and, and stuff like that so in my you know my belief is that you know even watching stuff like that helps kids understand you know oh, how do they do how do they deal with a bully at school how do they deal with a bully at at home right so but then we also under, understand like um the kids that are coming there that, that maybe aren't having a bad day maybe aren't doing maybe you don't know that maybe an uncle came home three o'clock in the morning drunk and was causing a ruckus and now that kid has to go to school right so we don't know what that kid is dealing with that during that time but when they start working with a horse and stuff, you know, sitting on a horse, I actually had his kid just, I told him, you know, just sit on the horse and we'll talk. He sat on the horse and, you know, you won't believe that he started opening up to me and starting, you know, I have a, I have a uh, background in addictions and, and stuff and a degree in addiction. So it helps me understand that, you know, when it's time to, 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 to go into counselor mode and, and help these kids and suggest things for them and stuff too. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. What kind of unique challenges, both mental health and otherwise, do folks from remote Indigenous communities face? <clears throat> well, I have worked in a few remote places, and it's resources. And how do they how do they get resources? A lot of a lot of the times, they're they're they're, they're met with um, a lot of uh, prejudice. Uh, so there's uh, you know. Um, they, they reach out to a, a professional and they're not very, they're not treated very nicely and they don't want to go back. Right. And again, it's all that trauma based uh, knowledge or that we have. Um, like if I, you know, I, we're afraid of RCMP, you know, we were taught to be afraid of RCMP and anybody in the uh, uniforms because of what the, the abuse that they put on my, my, my grandmother and my grandfather, my mom, my dad. So, um, you know, stuff like that is, in my opinion, that it's it's really hard to get past to get past that. Like, how do you how do you reach out to somebody and you know, and then like even doctors now or go to the hospital nowadays. Like, and it, ha- and it happens to me. You know, I, I go into a uh, I went into a, a a tire shop yesterday, and it, the guy was like, you know, he didn't he didn't want to deal with me because I was First Nations. Like, and I don't know what he he went through with somebody before, but. I have to put myself in that position too as well. You know, he might've had a bad experience and he thinks everybody's that way. Right. So, and that's kind of mentally, you know, and it's tough because, um, you know, reaching out for help and um, not having the resources there or being looked at as a different way would, would, uh, would make anybody not want to ask for help again. Yeah. You know what? You have this amazing insight, Marty, when you, when you talk about, how you were 
discriminated against, and yet you take that next step to try and understand perhaps what that other person's experiences has been, which which is driving that. And and I think I think if all of us could do that more, we'd be a much more understanding society in general. That's true. And even with people with mental health, I I worked with the homeless people in downtown Calgary on the. Um, I worked for the dope team for the Alpha House for for a few for a couple of years, and just seeing that as well, like you know, they we've uh, it's happened to every race around the world, but you know, um, it's you know they're they're dealing with their depression and mental health and and stuff. So you know, or, or you know, just to sit there and listen to people and, and stuff, it, it means a lot to a lot of people. You know, they yeah. don't want handouts, they don't want this, they don't want, but they just want somebody to listen to you know, to, to be heard. And that's, you know, a lot of the times, um, you know, I was always taught, you know, are you listening you, or, or, or are you, you just, you know, just hearing things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, when I read your bio, Marty, I'm, I'm, and then I saw you, I'm going, well, you're not old enough to have experienced everything that's in your bio, but there's that one piece in here that really is intriguing for me. And, and so can you tell us more about stunt nations? So back in 1994, I believe, uh, I was working on a show, a Canadian show called North of 60. I yeah. played the bad guy there, and my, uh, my, um, my, my head guy on the show was uh, Nathaniel Arcan. So we were sitting in the green room in the, on set one day, and we started talking about um, – I was doing stunts on a film, and then they hired me to be an actor. And I said, you know, then, but I can still do my own stunts. He said, well, it's really hard to find indigenous stunt guys to double us. Uh, back then, it was okay to paint people red and, and you know, paint people different colors. But now, with everything that's happening, that, that doesn't happen anymore. But it still happens to indigenous people. Um, there was a show just recently that, that wrapped up in, 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 uh, in around Calgary called Wind River, where they, got, they brought in a bunch of non-indigenous people to double the indigenous actors. So oh, really? I was, so stuff like that. So back then, Nathaniel and I said, well, we should we should start looking at something to train our, our youth to get them, you know, go get them going in this. We, and, you know, Nathaniel and I, we he, he became, you know, he started doing a little bit more films than I did. And I uh, I stuck with a, more stunt acting and, and whatnot. But uh, then I stepped away from Hollywood for a little bit you know, because I had a son with Down syndrome and I wanted to you know, try and be, be there for him. Um, and then I got a call for, to, to, to go do Outlander. Uh, and out, over in Scotland, uh, we, I reconnected with Nathaniel. Nathaniel and I have always been good friends. Uh, reconnected with Nathaniel because we both did um, season, um, season four of Outlander. And um, when we got back, we, we sat down and had a meeting and said, you know, we really should get going on this. So, we uh, came together, we, we formed a company and uh, started offering these workshops and it's been very successful. We've uh, been uh, featured in a lot of the news uh, stuff, news uh, outlets and everything else. And again, it's just, a, it's given indigenous people a chance, um, you know, getting them exposed to things. We have a world-class stunt coordinator that comes in and, and teaches them to what to do and how to do things, how to fall properly, what breaking our, again, as knowledge keepers, we, what we want to share that. Right. So, and that's what we try to do a lot is, is share the knowledge with our, our indigenous youth and, and, and try to spread. Not only that, but just anybody that wants, wants to join, like it's very you know, inclusive. You know, we, we believe that everybody has a right to, to learn this, this craft and that's what we do. Yeah. So, and, and you're uh, just a question here to help people understand this. So you're based in Alberta, are you, Marty? Yeah, I'm based out of uh, Morley, Alberta is the township name, but it's uh, um, they're changing it to Minisni, which okay. means cold water. And that's the reserve that I live on. It's the Stony Nakoda Reserve, just uh, in between. We're in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, just outside of Calgary. Okay. And so yeah. the stunt nations, when you do this training, is it based out of your reserve? Well, it, it has been for the past couple of years, but uh, we've been asked to come to different reserves as well. So we have, we've expanded to a couple of reserves in Alberta. Um, we've been asked to come to Toronto as well um, because 
you know, the best thing about us is that we are 100% First Nations owned and our people are first facilitators are First Nations as well. So, you know, not to say that, you know, there's other stunt companies out there that are, um, aren't doing it, but I know there's, there's people out there claiming to be this, but they're not, you know, it's the old, uh, I guess, uh, the, the um, and, and it happens everywhere. There's people out here that can, you know, they change their last name to something else that sounds indigenous and then they, you know, take in all of our indigenous dollars. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and so what kind of interest do you get from, from your youth? We get quite, you know, there's lots and not only just, for stunt acting, but for, uh, we bring in people that uh, have experience behind the camera, uh, grips, sound, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, um, they, they, they don't have to be an actor to be on film. You know, they can get into wardrobe, they can get into props, they can get, there's a lot of things that, you know, our people are very, there's a lot of talented people out there that, you know, that can, can do that. Now, nowadays with anime as well, that there's a lot of our indigenous youth are starting to get into anime. So, you know, it's like, well, you know, let's write a script together. Let's sit down and, you know, what it takes to write a script and how to put it together and stuff. So, you know, we're expanding those boundaries as well to to help people understand what it takes to get into uh, to, to this business. Yeah. Oh, that sounds awesome. Well, you know, Marty, I always run into this. Our half hour has gone by rather quickly. Uh, you, you lead a very, very interesting life, obviously, and do great work. Oh, but here's a, here's a last question for you. With all the work you do in support of others, what do you do to stay mentally well? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I've learned to take a lot of trips. I've learned to take care of my, uh, uh, to take uh, what they call a mental uh, break from everything. Uh, we've, we've, uh, both my wife and I, we've, we signed out this social media to give that part a break. Um, we, uh, I talk with my elders and uh you know i debrief we debrief on a daily basis uh, my wife uh, and i do have a very good relationship where we talk and and discuss the day um but i go back to my roots uh when i used to sit on top of the hill and think about things and and stuff so i go back to that and i go on top of that hill and i overlook our our place in morley and um from my place, we live on the east side of Morley, so when we look out, we can see everything in the mountains and everything else. And um, and just, you know, just see, being in that place and grounding my, re-grounding myself, it, it, you know, brings me back to what my whole intentions are, right? Yeah. Oh, I like that. Thank you very much, Marty, for joining me today. Uh, well, your insights you. into mental health and wellness certainly have resonated with me, as I'm sure they have with others. And I think that message you have, and I certainly have had that in the past as well, is we need to take the time to listen. We need to take the time to understand. And we also need to take the time to take care of our own mental wellness. Yes, we do. I believe that as well. Thank you again, Marty. Um, please, avail everybody out there, please avail yourself of the many resources available in the Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit, which can be found at ruralmentalwellness.com. If you've enjoyed this um, interview, please let your friends, family, neighbors know about it. Uh, it's going to be posted on YouTube and Facebook as well. So till next time, stay safe and stay well. Thank you.